Barack the rapper. Uh, just give you know the people at the Body Church here in San Diego an idea of who is Show Baraka the man. Who are yeah. You? Well, first of all, I love being in California because I was raised here. I was raised in San Bernardino, um, so the Inland Empire. Uh, when I was young, graduated high school in that area. So a lot of my formidable life, formidable life was, was kind of shaped in uh, California culture. My older brother, who is a pastor now of good friend of Victor, um, uh, planted the church. But he became a Christian when I was in high school, and he used to kind of communicate to me, share the gospel with me. And I wasn't trying to hear it. I was trying to live life. But three years later, after I graduated from high school, I became a Christian in college. And from there... My whole paradigm shifted um, from how I wanted to use my gift and talent. I went to school to study television and film. I always loved hip hop. So it, it, it went from, you know, celebrating the things of this world. You know, how do I use my skills my, and gifts to get women, to make money, to promote the things of this world, to man, how can I make the Lord famous with what I do? And so now what you see is an individual who's striving daily, to, you know, and struggling, not doing it perfectly, but struggling to what it looks like to make the Lord famous and, and with his time, talent, and treasure. So, got married, been t married 10 years now, have three children. That's right, I earned those 10 years. <laughs> Y'all better clap. It's hard. Uh, <laughs> but been married 10 years, got, I have three children. Um, I am an elder at our church, Blueprint in Atlanta. Um, so, I, I think that's pretty much a, a good kind of overall encompassing idea of who I am. All right, yeah. cool. Now, I just want to open this up, too. If anybody has any questions, we'll take uh, at least one question for Show Baraka. Just text it in to our church number. Mm. You should have it in, 619-786-0980, um, okay? Jesus is on the main line. There he is. It's on the main line. That's direct access. Tell him what you want. Um, to Rhea. <laughs> all right. Not me. <laughs> but um, all right. So, um, so, yeah, you can text those questions in. Uh, they will be filtered appropriately, okay? He told you he was married already, ladies, okay? Um, <laughs> So you have this, you're, you're on this mission to make Jesus famous. Like, what does that look like? Does that mean you stand on the street corners all day long and yeah. say, Jesus, 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 and like, let the whole world know by standing on the street corners? Like, how do you, how does Show Baraka make Jesus famous with his time, talent, and treasure? Yeah. So, I mean, that used to be me. I used to, when I didn't have a, a family and I was just a single dude who had nothing to do, I used to stand on street corners and just, hey, you know, Jesus, and, you know, getting arguments with people all the time. Uh, but then I had, you know, I started having more responsibilities. And so I, I had to realize is that although I'm not a pastor, although I can't stand on the street corners anymore, God still has the, has, has, I still have the responsibility to make him famous. And so um, one of the things that I've realized is I've always kind of wrestled with this idea of feeling like I was less than a Christian because I didn't ever want to work in a church or work for a Christian organization. And so sometimes I used to feel like, yo, am I, does that mean I don't love God? Because I wanted to work in entertainment. I grew up in outside Los Angeles, so I, I, my family members are in the Hollywood industry, and so that always has been something that I've enjoyed. Um, but it's, it was, I never really had insight on how to do that and be a Christian. Um, and the other thing I didn't want to do is make cheesy Christian films. Amen. Thank you know you. <laughs> <laughs> or even cheesy Christian rap. And so I was like, man, how, do I, how can I do excellent stuff but still represent Jesus? And uh, it's been a, a, like a four or five year process where, one, I've recognized that excellence is an amazing, amazing evangelism. So for Christians, if you work, no matter what you do, if you're in education, uh, if you're an artist, if you are a wonderful employee, that makes room for you to be a minister of the gospel. Amen. Because people are like, why are you working so hard? And we may not be the most talented people, but we're the hard we should be the hardest working. We should be the most diligent. We should be people who are above reproach. We shouldn't be stealing from our job. We shouldn't be cutting corners. And, people, and that should be a witness for people. And so for me, one of the things that I've been trying to do is how can I use my work ethic as a means of evangelism to people around me? But then on that, um, like... I may not rap, everything I rap about may not be about church culture, but I'm trying to communicate truth to a world that is clearly, clearly up against that. So if you look at, you know, listen to the radio, watch music videos, I mean, there are so many ways that I as an individual and an artist can communicate something directly about Jesus or indirectly. And there's a quote that I love um, from a gentleman named T. Boone, Car uh, T. Boone something, I can't remember his last name. But he says that um, as an artist, I can either write songs about the sun or I can b write songs about what the sun helps me see. 
And so for me, I, I see it sometimes, like as you heard the last song, I write songs about the sun. And then there's sometimes when I write songs about how, what the sun helps me see in this world, because there are some people who don't understand the deep truths of the gospel. So I try to unpack them for them and just talk about love in a way that's biblical. And so I have a song called We Can Be More that just talks about a healthy perspective of marriage and relationships. I don't say Jesus anywhere on the song. I say God like once. Um, but that song has been played on all kinds of secular stations. I've had opportunities to do songs and places because of that song. And what it does is like, man, I love this song. What made you write this song? And then I'm, bam, I have an opportunity to, to talk about Jesus and talk about healthy marriages, especially in a context today where marriage is being attacked from a biblical perspective. Yep. That's good. All right, so um, you mentioned that, like, you know, you felt at one point that you were in this limbo. You know, you love Jesus, but yet you're not uh, vocationally employed by a church. Um, and so you had this kind of tension that just understanding, like, how can I be a Christian and do things in excellence even outside of the church walls? Um, here in San Diego, as you know, in Southern California, like, people just regularly don't go to church. I mean, statistics say nine out of ten people in this city, San Diego, just are detached from a church. Um, you do a lot of ministry outside the church. Why do you still? Why are you still an elder at your church where you're at? Why are you still plugged in and honed into a church when anybody can look at your life and say you're successful outside of the church? Well, I think <clears throat> important one is because I left by myself. I'm a, I'm a while out. So I mean, everything in me wants to go back to smoking weed, mm -hmm. to having sex with every girl I meet. But I understand that I love the Lord with all my heart, mind, body, and soul. And if I go out there and live by myself and I'm not connected to a church, if I'm not connected to people who love the Lord and who are accountable to me, I'm a fail. Mm. I'm a fail as a Christian. And I feel like anybody who feels like they can live this life outside of, in their own strength, mm -hmm. they're mistaken. And so uh, I think it's very important that Christians as they are doing work in the church, out the church, that they always direct people back to the church because that's where God has established that his kingdom is going to be. Uh, it's, it's where people are going to be raised in maturity. Um, and so for me, uh, I want people to watch my life. I want people to hold me accountable. I want people to be challenging me like, hey, show, how could you have done that better? Or show, how could you do this and how could you do that? Because, man, ultimately at the end of the day, man, I want to serve the Lord. I want the Lord to be pleased with my work. Um, and it's so easy for us to get caught up in pleasing man um, and, and seeking our earthly rewards. But at the end, that all burns up. You know what I mean? Like, it, like I, can, I can get all these statuses and awards and acclaim, but that stuff is going gonna, is gonna to burn up one day. So That's good. Uh, Ray, is she around? All right, have you been getting any text messages? Okay, cool. We'll answer we'll a answer text message in a second. Uh, so at this point in your life, say you were to not make it home, you know, uh -huh. plane crash. I don't know, you know. Oh, wow. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate well, yeah, it. I was just saying, you know, <laughs> I'm not declaring that over your life. Yeah, but, I hear you. But it might happen. Are you saved? Okay. <laughs> so, okay, yes. anyway. Okay, so if that happened, you know, uh -huh. God forbid your life ended within the next 24 hours. Right. Like, what would you look back and say, like, wow, God was most pleased with this? Um, I would hope. I would hope and pray that he, he was just most pleased with how I lived my life, um, not only in front of people, but outside of the light. So uh, as I said, I'm a father, um, I'm a husband, uh, I'm a brother, and it's, it, it's so easy to just, I just, I hope and I pray that like when, I, when I'm dead and I land in the casket and there's 10, five people at my funeral, <laughs> Like, each one of those individuals say, man, he, he was an individual who loved the Lord with all his heart. Because that's, that's the bottom line. And then when they look at me as a father, they say, he wasn't a perfect father, but he tried his best. I mean, he tried to love his children. He tried to teach them in the way of the Lord. And then when somebody talks about me as a husband, it's like, he wasn't the greatest husband, but he tried. And he tried to serve his wife. He tried to outdo her in, in service and love. And then when somebody sees me as an artist, they say, and he probably, well, they will say I was the best artist. But they, uh, <laughs> he probably wasn't the best artist, but what the opportunities he had, you know, he didn't squander it. You know, he, he used them as an opportunity. And so for me, I just want people to see my life and, and glorify my, uh, my God in heaven. And so I would hope that when the Lord, when I stand before him, he, he just says, well, well, well done. Like, you know, you weren't perfect, but well done. That's cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, so you want to come up here right for a second? Can you, no? Can you just pass me your phone then or something? 
Okay, let's see. Um, um, okay, um, what would you say to people who struggle with living in God's grace as they are striving to put off the strongholds in their lives? Yeah. Uh, I, I would say two or three things. I can't, I don't know if I can remember the third, but one is that always being connected to the love letter of God. So, I mean, being in the scriptures, understanding what God communicates or seeing what thus says the Lord. If you want to know somebody, you obviously get to know uh, uh, how they communicate. And I think one, being connected to the scriptures is imperative. I can't ex Im Im express that enough like understanding what god says knowing what he says reading it meditating uh loving it enjoying it meditating re repeating it m like saving it in your heart those things are, are, are quite important too is something i think is very underrated um and i and i will say this that i don't think there's anywhere in the scriptures where god commands us to do things in our own like in our own of community he there's no commandment that you can fulfill without the context of community. And people will say, well, love God. Well, you can't love God without loving his people and loving um, his church. And so being connected to people who love God, I think, is so important. Because if I struggle with something, I'm praying that there are people in my context, in my community, that who can either relate, help me, you know what I'm saying, push me or challenge me, or even I can watch them and see how they're modeling. But oftentimes, we're a, a, a people who, you know, who, f who admit that we're wretched at the jump of salvation, but once we become Christians, it's like we feel like we have to act like we have it all together. Mm -hmm. And I would pray that we would be authentic and intimate with one another, bearing one another's burden. But the problem is, is oftentimes when you share stuff with somebody, you feel like they're going to use that against you. And uh, if people can't be authentic, then what they do is they keep it to themselves. And that sin starts to eat away at them. You know what I mean? And then it becomes a point where you be become ashamed to admit it and you hide it and you keep it. And then next thing you know, you out doing it again or you're out struggling on your, on your own. And so I would say, one, just love God. Love his word, but then love his community and, and submit yourself to people and relationships because it's no way we're going to make this thing without being in, in fellowship with one another. That's good. Which, a uh, little side note, that is why the body exists. I mean, we really do exist uh, to make committed followers of Jesus Christ who will in turn do the same through authentic relationships. You know, so exactly what you said. That's, that's the purpose of this church. Uh, next question is, if you could, could you please give one word of advice to those who strive for excellence in the Lord um, but keep getting rejected? <laughs> I got a sermon in my backpack for this one. Uh, so I'll try to make this short. So in the Old Testament, one of the things, that the, the, the two individuals that I am completely impressed with that just it blows my mind so many times reading it is Joseph and Daniel and one of the things about Joseph and Daniel that we see is Joseph was sold into slavery and then he goes through this process of you know rejection after rejection after rejection but one he realized and I stole this from Francis Chan pastor up in San Francisco he says rejection doesn't mean failure um, and oftentimes I think we feel like just because there's a no or there's a there's a there's someone who opposes us that means that we didn't do our job and oftentimes God is just using those as James 1 talks about like every opportunity for our maturation and for our, our producing a faith in the Lord and so when you see Joseph going through these heartaches and these problems but ultimately he's still trusting in the Lord I think it was like 13 years he was in prison before he got to the point where he was where he, God fulfilled his dream that he had when he was boasting that his brother's like, y'all going to serve me one day, watch. And so, but it took a process. And, and, and I will say Daniel in the same sense, in slavery, um, under King Nebuchadnezzar. But the, the, the amazing thing about them both were they were both in societies that were anti-God. But they didn't allow that to keep them from being excellent. And a lot of us, we work in secular society. And that just means, that doesn't mean that it's wicked. That just means that it's, it's anti, it's, it's no religious orientation. It just means that there's no place for, to talk about God. And, and even sometimes there's places where, where they may communicate, you know, anti-God kind of communication. But I would say instead of fleeing from that, I would say being like Daniel and Joseph, how can I put myself in a situation where I can be a light? Because if we look at both Daniel and Joseph, they were put in very high positions and they made dramatic changes, not only for themselves and for God, but for the people of Israel. 
And so when you get discouraged, I would say, man, just read through, you know, Daniel, read Jeremiah 27, 28, 29, and Daniel, the book of Daniel, and you'll see individuals who sought opportunities to be excellent for God amidst a, amidst a culture that was against God's truth and wisdom. Um, and then you'll realize, man, like, it's not necessarily about me, and then also that rejection is a failure, but it's about how do I use my gift and my talent, not only for the benefit of myself, but for God and for other people, because God has called us to serve one another. Um, so, Wow. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. Um, that was good. I All practiced right. that a couple times. <laughs> All right, last question. Uh, how do we be content with this life when we have, when, uh, with this life, what we have, and where everything around us is telling us that we need more and a more and better life. So how do we be content, you know, with Christ and when everything around us says, gimme, gimme, gimme? Yes, that's hard. It's crazy. Um, I, I think ultimately it's, it's so cliche, but it's just like it, until, you, until we recognize that God is our ultimate true satisfaction, nothing satisfied. The Bible talks about how our, our eyes are like the grave and... Uh, and I think in Ecclesiastes, uh, I think it's 8 or 9, chapter 8 or 9, it talks about there's, uh, God has placed eternity on every man's heart. And even as Christians, when you, become a, when you become a child of the king, that doesn't mean that all of our fleshly desires just disappear. It means that now we have a weapon that fights against those fleshly desires. And it's just about what animal you feed the most. Really, you know, the dog you the dog you you feed is the the dog that's the strongest. And uh, if you feed your flesh, that bad boy is gonna run your life. If you feed the spirit, um, that's what's go what you're gonna submit to. And I would challenge for those that when you, when you're surrounded in a culture that communicates take 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 give give get get get, get and and and, uh, and store up store up store up. And if we believe these, these, these communications, then that's what you're going to desire for. You know what I mean? But when you submit yourself to the scriptures and you're around people who serve and you're around people who are charitable, then I think what happens is your, mind step start, your mindset starts to change. You become countercultural. And you're saying instead of obtain, 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 whatever I get, I get for the benefit of God and other people. And then I always live my, hand, my life with my hand open. And... That doesn't mean like an open hand doesn't have possessions. It has possessions, but at any time that possession could be taken away from me. And then when it's taken away, it's cool because that's what it was supposed to be there for, for somebody to, to, to take. And there's an amazing sermon by a guy named E.V. Hill. And this was in old the... School. Yeah, old school pastor. Old school pastor preaching. Ah, and then Lord. Ah. So <laughs> if you can't do that, then you probably want to enjoy this pastor. But... He preached, a, he preached a message at his wife's funeral. So his wife passed away, and he preached at his wife's funeral. First of all, that's crazy. You know what I'm saying? For a man to get up at his wife's funeral, to be over the casket and preach a sermon. But he talks about how the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And so it, in the context of that, I was just so rocked to see a man have such a countercultural perspective to say, you know what? The Lord gave and he blessed me. He blessed me, but he took away. And who am I to be upset? Who am I to, to judge, the God, judge the God of heaven and earth uh, of what he chose, chooses to do with his creation? And um, I think it's about a mindset of recognizing that, man, we love God above what he's made. We don't love the creation over the creator. And so when we chase after the creator, you know, when you keep your eyes to the, to the, to the heavens, you, you, you're not infatuated with the stuff on the ground because you're, you're so focused on, on who, who, who made those things. So man. I would say, man, just becoming, and it's, it's easier said than done, obviously, but I think going back to being grounded in the scriptures, being around people, and if these people who are around you, even in the church, are materialistic, you probably need some new friends. You know what I'm saying? Um, because oftentimes even the church be, can become a beacon for materialism, and that's why Jesus was flipping over tables in the, in the temple. Um, so, yeah. That's cool, man. Let's clap it up for him.